Hey, guys. Hey, Mark. Good hey, Mark. Hey, Mark. How goes the battle? How goes the battle? Goes. Goes. I'm Amen. losing. <laughs> it's going and it's a battle. The um, uh, you know, you when you do these conference calls, sometimes you get frozen. Um, my laptop literally uh, was left in my car uh, overnight, so I, as it's thawing out, I'm calling him from my phone. I apologize for my tardiness. Um, so, Pete, I've got a copy of the tax uh, incentive program that was adopted back in 2004. Are we still using that as kind of the template? On yes, yeah, that's that'll be the uh, starting point. Um, for our conversation, I, I've got a uh, a couple of slides that I put together just to kind of summarize where we were, where where we might be going. If that's all right. Yeah, please. All right. Does everybody on the call have a copy of the um, tax incentive program adopted in 2004? That one somewhere. I do. It's out there somewhere, but. Okay. Can you guys see that screen? Yes. Yep. Okay. I know a couple of people have to uh, bug off at some point. So let me, uh, let me just jump into it. So obviously we're talking this morning about updating our tax incentive program. Uh, we met once before. So here's just a little history of our program. Uh, we've had it in place since 2004. Uh, it, the statute reference is there and it, they're basically referred to as fixing, fixing tax assessments. Um, we've had eight tax incentives granted since 1984. So we've been issuing these even before we actually had a policy. Two of them were for a HEPA up on the Berlin Turnpike, which is a different statute. Um, so we really had six in, instead of eight. Uh, four of them have been for multifamily. So half of them have been towards multifamily projects. Um, the minimum investment for a, a project that we've uh, granted an assessment for was 135,000. And then the biggest was the Borden, obviously, which was 28 million. Uh, the minimum benefit we gave at any for any one year was 30% uh, tax break. And then the, the biggest one was some of the more recent ones where we've given out uh, 100% uh, for a couple of years in some of those agreements. The shortest agreement was two years. And then the largest agreement was granted for seven years. Um, here's um, a slice of, of the agreement that we have actually issued over the years. Um, 1290 Silestein, which is the office building uh, across from the uh, uh, shopping center um, had a $3 million investment. Uh, we gave them a five-year deal uh, and we gave them 50% a year. Uh, Express hey guys, debt, the smallest, smallest project we've ever granted it was only $135,000 investment. Uh, we gave them a two-year 50% deal. Um, Pelton's um, invested uh, nearly half a million. They did create a bunch of jobs. Um, we gave them a three-year deal for 50% off a year. And then the two most recent ones, uh, the multifamily, the big multifamily projects, 275 Ridge Road, they invested 12 million. Um, we gave them a two year deal uh, at 100% a year. The other thing that we've did for some of these larger projects is during the construction phase, we didn't phase in the improvements. So we gave them uh, basically 100% during the construction timeframe as well. So it's a little misleading, um, but they were also frozen during the construction. The assessor has the ability to phase in the improvements uh, if she wanted to, but our agreement with them was we would not do that. And then lastly, the Pete, port. We're, Pete, we're still on the, stuck on the first screen. I Are you? you? You can only see the yeah. first screen? Yeah. I am. Oh, that's I'm, funny. I'm the same. Let me, um, let me see if we can go back here. Any oh. change? There we go. That's yeah, there you go. And back yep. to the beginning on my slide. Let me move forward here. Let me know that if it's if it moves. Yeah, it's moving now. All right. Are you on the heading? It says whether still tax agreements. Yeah. Yep. Yes. All right. So that's where we were. Um, so the Borden uh, project, uh, we gave them a seven-year deal. 
um, first three years, 100%, and then um, 70, 50, 40, and then 30. And that averages out to 65% of the taxes that would normally uh, be issued uh, in, the, in that seven-year program. So that's the most um, significant agreement we've entered, entered into. Um, these are our existing uh, guidelines in our uh, 2004 agreement that Mark, uh, uh, our 2004 policy that Mark was referencing. Uh, it, it doesn't make any sense, quite frankly, if you look at it. We've got several um, sort of competing categories here. Look, the 50K, anything over 50K, you can do 30% for three years, or you can do two years and it's negotiable. And then we have a $3 million category where you could go up to seven years negotiable or you give them 20%. So the, the whole policy, um, I think when it was approved back in 2004, it was kind of rushed so that we would have something on the books and uh, they didn't spend a lot of time kind of analyzing. Um, and, and, only, and it only goes up to 5 million um, when obviously we've had much more significant projects. Um, and these are guidelines at the end of the day, the town council under the present policy has the authority to determine what they want to do in terms of what uh, what schedules they want to apply to these developments. So uh, these these guidelines have not even really been followed to any significant degree. Uh, the important thing here is the minimum guidelines. Uh, anybody investing twenty five thousand dollars into a project is theoretically qualified. Uh, that's pretty low when you compare it to other other communities. Um, Peter, yes. The um, uh, thanks for letting me in. I'm trying to get into my computer. Um, great, thank you. Um, I uh, um, the other towns that we were looking at the last time. Which of the towns around us? have a uh, incentive program that you think is more uh, feasible than what we currently have. I know you were looking at Berlin. I know you were looking at Rocky Hill, Glastonbury. I think yep. Tony was mentioning on our last call um, that there was a, um, uh, a um, our, what our issues are and say Rocky Hill issues are, are two different things. So that may not necessarily be um, the best template, but what have you looked at that you think has got um, a little bit more horsepower than what we currently have? Uh, the short answer is the, the various communities are all over the place. There's no real um, consistency amongst um, any of the towns. Every town has somewhat of a different approach to it. So they're all unique in, in that respect. So I can't even, after looking at them all again in the last, last couple of days, they're all really they're all over the place. Some towns have the minimum $25,000 investment still so that literally almost any project could qualify. And then others have thresholds that start at $4 million of investment. Anything below that you don't qualify. So, uh, and then uh, many others have all these elaborate formulas um, and then others have just wide open where you can negotiate on a case by case basis. So I really, don't have any, I do have some recommendations for us to talk about or to at least get the conversation going, but there's no consistency uh, amongst any of the towns. It's, it's kind of revealing that all these towns have taken completely different, um, different approaches. So I, I really can't answer your question and I can't point to a community um, that I would kind of hold up as a model. I think it's really gonna be up to us to decide you know, I think we also need to look at our own history, you know, how we've applied these in the past to, to at least have some consistency, uh, if that's at all possible, so that we're not, you know, throwing the baby out with the bathwater here. So, um, so I, don't, I don't think that really answers your question, but I think it, it, it's really going to be up to us to determine what we want to do. And as they say, it's important to look at what we've done in the past, so we're not coming up with a completely new approach to giving out these incentives as we go forward. But as, a, as, the, as the slide before indicates, these are the towns that we really looked closely at. Um, and then obviously locally, we've got Rocky Hill, Berlin, 
Bloomfield and Windsor. Bloomfield and Windsor are, I would put them in a different category. They've had some huge, you know, distribution projects, you know, $80 million projects, and they've granted just these elaborate uh, incentives that I, I don't envision us ever really having to deal with. So um, those are kind of outliers. They do have some provisions in their policies that might be worth discussing, uh, but in terms of their formulas and their approaches, um, and it looks like to me that at the end of the day, they've also negotiated these independently of others. So I can't say that they necessarily have also followed a, a cookie cutter approach to what they've actually given to these development projects. So uh, anyway, um, but just to uh, real quickly go through our, um, our program, just so everybody's talking from the same page. Um, these are the general requirements that are in our policy. It has to, the benefits have to apply to, to real estate basically. Um, and you can qualify for a couple of different reasons. If you're locating your business to Weathersfield, so that would be a new business coming to town. If you're um, replacing a building, you're doing new construction, you're expanding or you're remodeling, you can qualify. Um, if you're investing in equipment, we have language in there that that would also qualify, but it conflicts with the, the real estate uh, items. So there's some conflicts there. Uh, if you're increasing employment, uh, you can qualify. And then if you're preserving uh, existing employment, that's another criteria that we use to determine if um, we would grant a tax incentive. This is the application procedure. It's reasonably straightforward. We do have an application form. Uh, they apply to the Planning and Economic Development Office. Uh, we, we pull together the Tax Incentive Program Committee, which consists of the town manager, finance director, the assessor, uh, myself, and then an EDI, EDIC designee, and that's been the, the chairman uh, recently. That group has 30 days to review the proposal. They make a recommendation to council. Council has 35 days to review it, and it's a simple majority vote of the town council. And then after all that's done, we enter into a written um, tax incentive agreement. Um, it probably makes some sense as we're going through this process that we come up with a standardized agreement. We've got a couple of uh, agreements out there right now and they, they aren't necessarily consistent with each other. So in terms of how these agreements are enforced, I think it would make sense for us to come up with a pretty much a standard agreement uh, where you fill in the blanks in terms of the benefits, but everybody's held to the same, same standards. So that's something um, I think uh, we want to probably, uh, coming out of this process, we want to make some recommendations in that respect. We're having uh, an issue with one of them right now um, in terms of interpreting the agreement. So um, something to think about. Um, these are some of the requirements that we typically have in the tax agreement that the construction must begin in a year that it must be completed in two years. Uh, if not, the agreement is terminated. There's normally language in there. If they don't pay their taxes, uh, the agreement is terminated. And then um, if there's delinquent taxes, uh, there's language in there that a developer um, cannot enter into an agreement with us until those tax delinquencies are remedied. For some reason, there's language in there about water and sewer taxes, which obviously doesn't apply to us. So uh, we, we need to make some changes to that as well. As I said earlier, I think the 2004 agreement was kind of rushed, rushed through a process. Um, the reason we're kind of here today is that there have been changes to the statutes that uh, allow us a great deal more flexibility than we had in the past. Um, before the statute only allowed you to do a seven year maximum. You can go to 10 years now. Um, the statute used to have a specific schedule uh, that's been taken out of the statutes. And th there were some minimum investment criteria in the statutes and those have also been taken out. So basically the statute uh, gives authority to do these things and takes away some of the limitations and some of the guidelines as well. Uh, they've also added different types of uses that can benefit from the tax incentives, mixed use developments, retail now qualifies, health systems, and then, um, Multifamily, uh, multifamily developments qualify now. 
As I said earlier, we reviewed a whole bunch of, at our last meeting, we went into a great deal of detail about uh, what other towns have been doing. And as I said earlier, they're really all over the place. Um, so here's a, these are kind of the topics I'd like to talk about today and get some feedback as we consider changes to the policy. Um, some towns specifically target project types, whether it's distribution centers, whether it's manufacturing. Um, so that's something for us to talk about. I don't know that we necessarily need to do that, but nevertheless, some communities only allow tax incentives to apply to certain types of projects. So let's, let's start with a, with a conversation about that, if anyone feels strongly about that. I just have a question. Um, what is considered a health system? Good question. I'm not sure myself. Um, and the statute doesn't provide a great deal of guidance. So um, I'm assuming it's, you know, medical, medical offices, medical, you know. Um, like affiliated with a hospital versus an independent Kathy's Urgent Care, perhaps? Right. Yeah. As, say, the, and the like. as is typically the case in a lot of these statutes, they don't provide that kind of guidance. We probably would have to go back into the the record when the statutes were amended to kind of understand what what that is but that is a good good question and i don't have an answer for you okay thanks yeah hey hey peter it's paul i uh i, I was thinking along the same lines i didn't zero on the health care first of all it's great that the categories are expanded but then it sounds like the challenge becomes or or the opportunity is to go through and look at possible subcategories that you'd want to incent more within them or some that you don't want to see growth around right and do we have the opportunity to do that? I think we certainly could. We could get into that level uh, of detail. Um, or if there's categories in there that we really don't want to fund, we could take those out or specifically state that in the policy. So uh, if there are things, um, you know, some communities won't. Um, I think I saw one that basically said we will we will fund, we will grant incentives to restaurants, but not to fast food restaurants or restaurants with drive-throughs. So you could get into right. that level um, of detail if you'd like. So if there are things out there that you would hate to see the town uh, partnering in, um, maybe I use the example of self-storage, then we could certainly get into that if, if, if you want to do that. Yeah, I was thinking more along, I wasn't thinking more of rule outs, I was thinking more of, you know, things you really want to incentivize, you know, I don't know. Right, health, right. You know, health, health oriented things. I don't know, I'm making stuff up, I'm not caffeinated, but um, yep. yeah, okay. As long as we know we have that flexibility, that's really good. So bullet number five, additional incentives. There are uh, communities that provide uh, the ability for a developer to come to the table to get an additional incentive above and beyond the normal incentives if they're uh, effectively dealing with some of these issues, such as you know taking care of a blighted proper property and underutilized property, if they're significantly uh, increasing the tax base, uh, if it's implementing uh, a strategic plan that you have, you know if if for example our plan of development targets individual properties. So if uh, this developer was dealing with that project and, and implementing it, you could give them an additional incentive above and beyond. If they're creating a whole bunch of higher paying jobs, um, once, as I said earlier, if it's a specific property that we've targeted uh, or uh, in some communities, if they're um, agreeing to, uh, you know, in, in certain, certain employment targets, minority employment, for example, they can get an additional uh, incentive as well, above and beyond what the policy states. So that might be a way of, of tackling that particular issue. Um, as I said at the beginning, some towns have made certain kinds of businesses ineligible for the program. So that's the other side of the coin, targeting businesses versus taking certain ones out of the incentive program. Several towns have different standards for uh, the incentives, uh, if you're an existing business in the community, they give them a greater incentive versus a new business coming to town. So that's an approach that we saw in a couple of other communities. Um, we talked 
uh, earlier, some towns will only do real property or real estate uh, tax incentives versus personal property and equipment incentives. Um, so that's uh, another approach. Uh, we talked about the additional incentives. Uh, some towns, as I said earlier, the towns are all over the place in terms of the minimum amount of investment uh, that would qualify. As I say, our existing policy is down to $25,000. So if you, you're investing $25,000 in a project, you can request a tax incentive. You're not gonna get much of a tax incentive because the 25,000 doesn't really increase the assessed value of the property very much, but nevertheless, it allows you to come to the table and have, have a conversation. What other towns have done is they have taken out the minimum investment levels and they've converted that to uh, whatever the end product project is going to increase the assessment value of the property is the number that they look at. So um, that's a different approach than we have. We have a minimum investment level approach, whereas other towns basically say, if you're gonna increase the valuation of the property by a million dollars, this is the benefit we're going to, to give you. So um, that's also something for us to think about. Several towns require a pro forma or a cost benefit analysis specifically in their policy. We don't have that. So I, and we've been requiring it. So I think it's something we need to be specific about and put in our policy. As I said earlier, the, the abatement schedules, the number of years and the percentages are all over the board based on these communities. So the next slide I think uh, makes some possible suggestions on what we might wanna do there. But the bottom line is most of these communities, the bigger the project, the bigger the, the incentive that they will give, which, which kind of makes sense. Um, so the bigger the project, the more years you can get the incentive and the uh, greater the percentage incentive you can get. So I'd love to hear people's thoughts on any of these topics. I think we'd want to leave the personal property in. I mean, we haven't got that much manufacturing, but we've got like Kelly's down on Church Street. You got Kane up on Notch, uh, Wells Road, and was was it Triwinger on the Silestine? I think you'd want to give them the incentive if they turn around and update their equipment to uh, be more productive and keep the business in town instead of having them move out. They've been around for a long time, so I think it's something we want to keep in. Okay. What do you think about the minimum investment level or the minimum increased assessment valuation concept? As I said earlier, some communities are million dollar minimum. There's one that's $4 million minimum. And then there are others that are 25,000. So that's uh, an important topic for us to probably discuss. I think one of the things, Pete, you know, from a what does it cost the town in expense and staffing to, um, you know, for somebody with a project around $25,000? I mean, how much are we gaining versus how much are we spending to process something like that? Right. Shed some light on that. Uh, it's hard to, it's hard. Uh, probably the biggest cost is for the town attorney to negotiate the terms and conditions for the agreement. Um, if we came up with a standardized agreement, that would minimize the amount of uh, involvement that the town attorney would have. But for example, on the Ridge Road, the Ridge Road agreement, um, I think we went back and forth six different times with various changes, numerous meetings. So you can uh, eat up a lot of uh, town attorney um, charges, uh, I, could, I could actually probably go back and, and actually, you know, find that out if, if it's if it's that important. But yeah, I think you make a good point that plus the 25,000 minimum really doesn't increase the assess. And we've had nothing anywhere near that. I mean, as I said earlier, the minimum was 135 so far over all the years we've had the program. So I think we definitely want to want to kick that up um, higher than it is today. I mean, if the market has spoken to us, if the minimum has been 130,000 for how, 
how many years? Have you, is it over the since two thousand four? It's even before that. We we did a we did some agreements in the um, in the nineties too. So, so I, th I think we can have at least chat about or and think about that eliminating the twenty five thousand and hundred thousand dollar limits would be a good start at the yep. very minimum, especially if we're again since the beginning of time our our least deal was one hundred and thirty thousand. Yep. Would that make sense. Yep. So so that Here's brings us thing. brings us to the next slide. Here's a suggested suggested uh, new approach. Um, obviously, the town council can, at the end of the day, do whatever it is that they uh, ultimately want to do, and they have that flexibility. But I think it's important that we provide them with at least a framework for developers coming to town so they know what we might be willing uh, to consider, and then they can they can take it from there. And, and what I'm thinking here is that, you know, not every developer has the same uh, needs and issues. So what I was thinking we would do is come up with what they call an average approach. So we would give them, um, for example, uh, in the two year scenario, they could take all of their incentive in the first year, if they, if they really, if, if the project really needs it, and then have nothing in the second year, as long as the two years average out to a 30% uh, incentive. And that would be the same approach. So that gives the, the council and the developers some flexibility to fit the percentages into the number of years uh, and doesn't necessarily lock it in like other towns do where they have a very rigid formula uh, because not one size fits all. Um, some projects need you know, 100% benefit the first year and then once they get up and running, um, the need dissipates. So if they wanted to front load it uh, in the first year or two, and then uh, even though they might have a five-year deal, you know they're getting nothing in the fourth and fifth year. Uh, I, I think that is an approach that provides flexibility, but also establishes some guidelines uh, for the council to negotiate these things under. Um, I would also suggest rather than staying with the investment approach where if you're putting $100,000 into it, you qualify, it really should be based on the, at the end of the day, what the increased assessed value of the property is. Cause that's how the tax incentive program works. It's not based on, you know, them getting a benefit on how much they're investing. It's what the assessed value increase is at the end of the project. So, um, so this formula kicks the $25,000 up to 100,000 minimum, but it's not just investment. It's the uh, project has to increase the assessed value of the property by $100,000. So this approach is basically the bigger the project is, the longer the term is, and, and basically the bigger the incentive is. Uh, and it does, to a certain extent, uh, kind of mimic what we've historically uh, been doing with these projects. Uh, for example, the, the Borden, which was 28 million, would obviously be over the 15 million. Uh, they got a six year deal. They ended up getting a 65% uh, average benefit, but I think a 50% based on what other towns are doing is a reasonable approach. And they could front load it, you know, for the first couple of years if they wanted to. Um, but at the end of the day, over those six years, they would only get a 50% tax break. So this is just the starting for a starting conversation to see what everybody thinks about this kind of approach. And I hope I made sense as I tried to explain that. Um, you have Pete, I'll be the one to tell you have, it's, a, it's crickets and it's a tough group. I, I think it looks good. Off yeah, I was gonna say, I, it's Paul, I couldn't get off mute fast enough. I, I think it sounds good. The only thing I might consider is maybe raising a hundred thousand to two fifty, two hundred fifty thousand minimum. Yeah, as I said, uh, the hundred thousand is is still comparably low when you look at other communities. But I didn't want to, I didn't want to, you know, get too high as a minimum threshold. As I said, we had a, we have, we have had one hundred and thirty-five thousand 
dollar project. Um, but then the next lowest was 450, I think. So 250 Can would be. Yeah. Um, so, cause I'm new to this game. Once these are set, are adapted, are they set in stone or can there be exceptions? I would add language in here that has exceptions. It, it's ultimately up to the council, um, but I think they have to have some framework as a starting point. As I said, I think it's, I think I would put language in there about, there are potentially additional incentives available if they are implementing some of those, um, targets that, you know, if they're implementing, uh, fixing up a blighted property or va vacant property, if it's, you know, really been targeted by the community for redevelopment and they're going to be the developer to do that, I think there should be some flexibility in there for the council to potentially grant um, an additional incentive. So these would be guidelines rather than hard and fast rules. That way there's flexibility. Because not not every you know project fits into these. Right. Thank you. I think it's a no brainer that it has to do with uh, with what the assessed value increase should be as well. You know, I think the numbers, I mean, um, if this is, you know, this is obviously a critical piece, I think these numbers make sense. I think Tony's um, pushed to 250, maybe that's a little aggressive, but I, I don't, you know, it's, if it went from 130 to 450, is that what you mentioned, 130, and the next one up was 450? Yes, yes. Um, you know, maybe compromise and make that 200 grand. Would you compromise on that, Mr. Martino? Yeah, uh, I was just thinking of, you know, uh, the cost of the building permit and the legal fees might be offset somewhat if it was in a 200-250 range, you know? Because yeah. I don't know what the building permits are now. I know the, the values have gone up. So if it was 200-250, it's, you know, it's this better amount that might offset all the legal fees to put us at a, you know, zero cost of putting it on except the loss of taxes for a short period of time to bring them to town. Mm -hmm. I would like to see that $500,000 amount move to a million in both instances. I think it, the first two categories going from 100,000 to 3 million are, that's a huge spread. So in the so you're suggesting in the first bullet, we we kick the five hundred thousand up to a million, and in the second bullet, a million to three million. Yes. Okay. Mm. What does everybody think about the percentages and the number of years? As I said earlier, the statute uh, allows up to ten years. I think that's uh, quite excessive. Um, when I looked at the other communities, the longest tax incentive I saw was seven years. That's why I came up with the six years. I didn't see any that went to 10 years uh, or beyond seven years. And it's probably because of the statute, you know, just recently changing. Uh, and there were only two communities that in their policy had language that said they were authorized to grant up to 10 years. So I stayed away from that full maximum. From a competitive perspective, Pete, is the six year, is that pretty standard on the bigger, you know, the, 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 the mega loans? Is that pretty competitive with other towns? Yeah, there were a couple that were seven years, but yeah, and that's why I came up with the six years. I mean, they, they had, there were some, some communities, there were a couple of projects that were $80 million in investment. And they, yeah, so that's, those are the outliers. But I think as, as, as Deb and others have mentioned, there is flexibility with the council. If something comes in and it's, we're trying to be competitive, there is flexibility. Okay. Yes, I would definitely recommend that. You mentioned before, Peter, a standardized agreement. Yes. Um, it, 
tell me tell me about that how what is our process now do we start from square one with everybody is, are, are they all different and how you know what would it take to get a standardized agreement and is that something that would make sense um it, it's certainly something i would recommend uh certainly the agreements could be modified to a certain extent but i think it's important that there are you know standard uh requirements that apply to uh, all of the projects in terms of start times and completion dates and, and and other provisions such as you know keeping current with taxes and and things like that there's some we, we have used a previous agreements to build upon the the new agreements but i think it's important that we we do have a standard template um, i mean it wouldn't necessarily be completely locked in and the attorneys could but i think there have there have to be some common requirements that apply to everybody sure. and that um, are also contained within our whatever policy we come up with. So um, yes, I think it's uh, it's important for consistency that we have a, a standardized agreement. And obviously they plug in the details, you know, of how many years and the percentages and things like that. So uh, the, the tax assessor has had some issues recently with a couple of the agreements in terms of the language and not being completely clear and you know what the intent was and things like that. So uh, it would be helpful for, I think, all parties, including the developers, so that, uh, for example, we've got an agreement that uh, Jeff Bridges negotiated. He's not here anymore. So now there's questions coming up about, well, we had, that wasn't what we had talked about or that wasn't, and it didn't translate into the agreement. So um, people do change and, you know, the, you know, some of these projects take seven years to come to fruition in terms of when they have to start paying taxes and, you know, things change over time. So I think a uh, lesson learned that we probably should have a more standardized approach to these agreements. So uh, unless anybody has any uh, objections, obviously we want to make that part of our plan then, Peter, is that we have a standardized agreement. And again, I, that works for for the developer and the town, and the, yes. there's no misgivings. I agree. You know, and if, you know, if the developer has a bad experience with us here over something innocent, it's not you know developers talk. So having something standardized makes a lot of sense. So it looks like you know if we want to break. I'm just looking at the original document, Pete, on the original tax incentive program. You know, we talked about the eligibility. Is everybody? Can you just go through what we discussed, Pete? Just so we're on record. I'm sorry. You can go back to the of the different abatement schedule. This one here? No, the one that we were just at that broke down the starting Oh, you want to go back? You want, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's okay. So, this one here. yeah, why don't we just come to some agreements here to make sure. Can you start with bullet point one? And there sure. was recommendations made here. And then if we're in a group, we can just maybe as a group agree uh, to this particular piece. So my notes, uh, uh, indicate kick the uh, increase the 200 the 100 to 200 increase the 500 to a million in that first bullet and then consequently bullet two would change from 500 to a million up to three million yeah in terms of the numbers those were the only two comments that i heard so bullet one would be 200,000 to 1 million Yes. Well, it would be million to three million, and the yeah. other three would stay as is. Is that correct? How does the group feel about that? That's good. But, um, another question. So, are we trying to get away from the hundred percent, um, or is that just going to be considered in the flexibility? It would be considered in the flexibility. So, the fifty, per, the 30, 40, 40, 40, 50, and fifty percent would yeah. be the pocket of benefits that would be available to them as an average over the agreement. Okay. They could negotiate um, their own terms. They could front load it. They could average it out to 50 every year. It's really up to how it, how they want to take advantage of it um, so that, that that would be the flexibility that they would have. But the pot, the pot of funds would be the percentage that would be available to them. Maximum benefit, Peter. Yes. Okay, so are we good on those numbers, guys? So we can take it a, a start with something here. I yep. think that I think that makes sense. 
Yeah, I'm good with those. I have to uh, jump off, but I'm um, happy to have further discussion. But uh, Peter, thanks for all your work on this. No problem. Thanks. Have a good day. Thank you. Hey, Pete, it's Pat. Hey, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just going back and forth between Zooms, but I am listening. Yep. Um, I, 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 I'm not going to speak for the entire council, but I will speak for myself. I think this absolutely makes sense as a starting point. Um, I think, like you said, flexibility is key when you're working with some of these developers, but at the same time, the policy definitely needs a little bit of updating and, and we have to at least know, you know, two goalposts to play between. So I think the start does just that and um, I'm, I'm all good with it. But like I said, I'm not going to speak for the rest of council. Of course. Yep. Of course not. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Good, so we're good on that, Pete. So you were gonna to go to the other slide. Which slide do you wanna see, Mark? Um, I, if we can go to the eligibility and maybe sure. um, get that. I think there was also some questions on, you know, um, if, are they still uh, relevant? And I think there was some questions on what exactly were they? Yeah, so I, so I guess I, I threw that out there earlier is do we want to just follow, basically under the statute, almost everything that you can think of is, is theoretically eligible. So I guess we would pose the question, is that, is that okay? Um, or do we wanna specifically make certain projects ineligible in the policy so that somebody you know, can't come to the table with a, with a project that um, we wouldn't really wanna support? You know, why have it in there if, um, we're not ultimately going to support it. And, and I, I don't wanna pick on anything, but I use the self storage uh, because it's a recent topic um, as maybe just to start a conversation or, or, or think about other things out there that you really wouldn't wanna see the town partner with the developer. Well, the, the last one that adopted in 2004, I'm just gonna go through the list and tell me if they should belong on here or not, or if they are manufacturing use, where would that come in under these particular, um, the, are these gonna be added to the list of 10 that are in well, the original agreement? Yeah, so this slide is, um, are, are the things that were added in the statute, it, not added, not not uh, specific to our policy. So what you're, you've got the policy in your hands. So I, let's, let's, why don't you, yeah, why don't you go through that list, share it with everybody. Right. Um, there's 10 on here. The first one is manufacturing use. Yep. Second one is office use. Yep. Mm -hmm. Third one is retail use. Mm -hmm. Fourth is storage, warehouse, or distribution. Five was structured multi level parking. Six was information technology. Seven was recreation facilities. Eight was transportation facilities. Nine was permanent residential use. <laughs> and 10 was transient residential use. So the question, Pete, is, um, you know, from an eligibility perspective, are we going to stick with these 10 guys or do we want to modify this? Because um, we need to define this, obviously, either stick with what we've got or modify it. I mean, listening to you, Mark, it sounded like every, just, just about everything that he's got listed as added was in the original 10. I don't know if we have to add health systems because it permanent or transitory was already there. Retail was there, mixed use development, I think was there. So I think it would be just having to add health systems to bring everything that was in the uh, statutory revisions to that list. Unless somebody yeah, wanted to eliminate something that was already in the tent. Well, one of them we do have in there is number four, storage, warehouse or distribution use. Um, I don't know, you know, based on our recent um, um, legislation, um, storage, warehouse, or distribution, any modifications there, Pete, or? Um... 
Yeah, I only threw it out there as a recent example, but looks like it would they would qualify under our present policy. Um, but then again, if 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 they come in with a project that you know we've already revised the regulations to encourage right. multi-story and yep. mixed use, uh, why you know why wouldn't we want to have a conversation? Those are also <coughs> uh, high big tax generating projects, so. Uh, yep. I could see a developer wanting to talk to us about uh, an incentive and, um, you know, if they're doing what we've done in the regulations and we're all okay with that, you know, why not? Particularly, no, if, it's, yep. particularly if it's going to take care of a blighted property or, you know, help with the redevelopment of a property and it helps the numbers for the project to work better. Um, why not? Yeah. So I, I don't, I'm not necessarily recommending that we narrow down the eligible projects. So I just wanted to make sure you understood that some towns have done that uh, and whether we wanted to do that or not is really up to the, up to the commission. What would you say, Pete, would be the next thing we should uh, look at and, and consider based on what you're presenting this morning? I think the big takeaway I had was the, you know, the formula and, and obviously whether we wanted to do anything uh, with the, uh, you know, eligible uses. So those are the big, two big things that I think I needed to get some guidance from today. Uh, and uh, I can work on all of the other uh, details uh, uh, as we go forward. But those were the biggies that I, you know, needed to have as, as takeaways this morning. And the standardized agreement obviously is a, something as well. Yeah. Yes. So that's uh, another task. So I can start um, marking up the existing policy, redlining it, showing what, what what's existing and you know what's proposed, and we can um, I'll, I can distribute that uh, before our next meeting so everybody can look at it, and I'll plug in the new formula, and we'll start to get into the into the weeds a little bit on language, and um, and uh, you know and I, and I didn't I didn't hear anything. From anybody uh, feeling strongly uh, about some of the other things, so I think I've got some good guidance to uh, move it to the next uh, next step. And it was good to hear from Pat, you know, that he uh, thought this was a, a logical approach. So we will also, uh, at some point, need to reach out, I think, to the council before we finalize this, just to make sure they understand, you know, the work that you guys have done and why we're recommending uh, changes. So we'll have to talk to the manager about what the best way to do that is, because they will ultimately Pete, have to approve this. Pete, um, so once this is all adapted, can there be revisions made at any time or does this have to stay in place for X amount of time? No, it, it's like any other, uh, I mean, it's, and it's a policy, it's not a regulation. So it's really just okay. a policy statement. Um, and it's probably something we should have revised you know, some years ago. So it's, um, it's meant to uh, change and evolve over time. One last thing, and then I think we can wrap up. I've, I've got to get going myself personally. We can, you guys can still continue, obviously, uh, if need be. But the, um, the issue that you're having now with one of the agreements, um, with, I, I'm not interested in the nitty gritty, but are we addressing what that issue was with that particular developer with that tax issue now, or is it, I mean, or is that another something else we should discuss or is it what you've got here kind of help out or would that be in that standardized agreement? Would it be fixed in that standardized agreement? It's more of a, an interpretation of the agreement we have with them and how it applies to some of the timelines. So um, I think <clears throat> the, the lesson we've learned from that, it, there needs to be some definitions um, in the agreement so that it's not subject to interpretation. Okay. And so, you know, how, how would you accomplish that? Would that, that be more spelled out in that standardized agreement? Is that what you're saying? That... Yes, okay. there would be definitions, um, examples maybe. Um, so it's just a matter of, uh, you know, getting you know, some uniform definitions that are in the agreement rather than subject to an, an, two different attorneys' interpretation. Got it. 
You know how those attorneys are. Who's an attorney on the call, so I'm not saying anything. That's right. Any other, um, anything else for us to contemplate at the moment, Peter? No, that was it. The only other thing that some towns do, uh, we have not done that, um, is to waive or reduce building permit fees as a, as a development incentive. Um, I haven't really researched that, um, that issue and it's probably not something we would put into this policy, but it's something at some point we might want to spend some time discussing. Um, I mean, building permit fees can be substantial, um, but we also rely on those, that revenue stream. Um, so, it, but it is something that, you know, in certain cases uh, can be significant and might be viewed as a development incentive. So probably a conversation for another day um, after we do some research and see what other towns are doing, just so we're understanding, you know, our competitors. So, um, and there's some strong feelings about it because we do rely on it as a revenue stream, but um, we don't need to get into that. We don't need to cloud this process with that one. Great. Well, uh, to, to further not cloud it, um, uh, if you, or maybe help me, we'll put the clouds in a jar. What do you think in the average product? We took the, our middle of our um, um, eligibility, our abatement schedule. What would the, what would the average project uh, um, throw off in fees, building fees? Can you give me a rough idea? What that yeah, I don't know what, I don't know what we would, yeah, I don't know what we can define as an average, but I can, I can um, very easily through our permit system pull together um, some recent examples, uh, what people have paid for the various permits, whether it's plumbing or building or electrical. So I can start pulling that together so you get an understanding of, um, of what we're talking about. I, would, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't hazard a guess today without, you know, plus I don't know what you mean by an, you know, an average project. Obviously the board and those numbers were probably very, very significant. Uh, but we have the we have the bank coming in uh, across from the board, and so that might be, and that's not a huge project, so that might kind of be viewed as a typical. So I can probably pull those that information together pretty quickly, so at least you understand, you know, be ballpark, ballpark numbers. Peter, if you go to look to uh, reduce the building permit fees. You might be able to do it on the town end, but you wouldn't be able to do it on the state fees. I think those would have to remain constant. I don't think we can change those. Right. And then the other question would be using the bank as an example. If you were going to say reduce the building permit fees, would it just be on erecting the new business or would it be on the, the building permit also needed to demolition the old building? Yeah, I think we would, we would open it up. So all, all considering all of those fees, and then, um, but I think it, it would be helpful to understand uh, what those fees actually are today, mm -hmm. and how much money it, it and, you know, it, and it may not be significant. So it may not be, you know, I'm not sure what developers, you know, feel about that. But nevertheless, it, every little, every little thing helps sometimes. But we also don't want to give away the store. So that's right. Competitive, but reasonable. Okay. Yes. Yes. Anything else, Pete? That was it for me. Any other questions from the group? Good presentation, Peter. Yep. Thank you, Pete. Guys, You're thank welcome. you. Thanks okay. for attending. Peter, if you have nothing else, um, can we adjourn? Yes, we're adjourned. If uh, just Mark, if you get, if you've got some time, can you give me a call? Just a couple of odds and ends out there that yep. we just need to touch, uh, touch base about. Yep. I'll, I'll call you as soon as we wrap up. All right. Thanks, Pete. Bye, guys. Okay, guys. Have a good one, everybody. All right, guys. Have a good day. All right. You too.